I'll wait for one more person to let me know they can hear us. Welcome to Virtual State Advocacy Day 2020 for the state of California. This is the second webinar in our series for our state advocacy and our virtual mar march to expand telehealth throughout the state of California. You guys can hear us now. Sounds like you can hear us now. Well, I want to welcome our speakers for today. We have Prentice Tom, the Chief Innovation Officer from Vituity. Uh, Prentice oversees the development and implementation of healthcare service solutions and the development and adoption of new health and medical technologies. Uh, if you've been to our ICS conferences, hopefully you've had a chance to hear Dr. Tom speak. I think he's got some great things to say today about the current state of telehealth. We also have Mei Kwong, who is the director for the Center for Connected Health Policy here in Sacramento. Uh, CCHP is the federally designated National Telepolicy Resource Center, so it is a national center. It's not just focused on California, and we're excited to hear from May about what's going on uh, both nationally at the state level with telehealth. So in addition to that today, we're going to talk about our virtual march to support the Senate and Assembly bills that are on the floor currently for expansion of telehealth. So hoping that uh, if you haven't joined the virtual march either today through this process or right after the event today, you'll take that one minute that it takes to sign your name and join our virtual march. I'm going to go ahead and kick this off with uh, Prentice. Uh, Dr. Tom. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Before before we start, I just want to make sure that uh, the audience can hear me on this um, platform. Is If someone could just shoot a note off if uh, uh, audio is coming clearly, I'd appreciate it. Great. Perfect. Um, so I, I do have some slides to share with you. I'm hoping you can see them. First of all, I just want to thank Nancy. It's a real pleasure to be here. I always enjoy um, the HIMSS events, and I really appreciate the effort that uh, Northern California HIMSS is making to increase the availability and usage of telemedicine. I um, have worked for Vituity for some time, and we've used telemedicine in a variety of formats, everything from follow-up after inpatient visits to primary care, to specified services in uh, psychiatric emergencies, neurology, and we even contract with large other groups to provide um, telemedicine services nationwide. And this has increased dramatically with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic that's affected us. So it's a real pleasure to be here today. I'm gonna to be discussing the current state of telemedicine. And um, before I start, I just wanna preface this by saying telemedicine is changing so incredibly rapidly right now that to provide a the current state, it's by the time you're talking about it, it's outdated. It is, we're at a very early stage of the use of telemedicine. It's really in its infancy still. Um, and yet it's already so broad and expanding so rapidly that to try to cover it all in a short period of time is, is literally impossible. So what I want to do is just provide some highlights. Um, Jenny, next slide. What I, to start, I want to point out that COVID, as everyone's aware, has been a real catalyst for the increased use of telemedicine. But before, but I want to be clear, it's been a catalyst and a catalyst doesn't really change the end result or the end reaction what it does is it just speeds it up. It's been known for quite some time that telemedicine actually provides a significant value proposition for uh, healthcare delivery. And I know that many of, probably many of the people on this uh, webinar actually have been very frustrated with the slowness in which the, the technology has been adopted. There's a number of significant advantages to telemedicine. One is its scalability. And we look at programs like inpatient neurology, where you used to have to have a neurologist on for every single hospital. But now you can have one neurologist who takes call at literally 25 
20, 30 hospitals at a time because they just don't see that many um, neurologic cases that are necessary to be seen on an emergent basis. Telemedicine allows for significant scalability of their services. Similarly with psychiatric care, many other different services, there's a significant cost efficiency both to the patient and to the clinician. It actually improves the allocation of resources and clinician time. It improves timeliness and actually it improves care, um, not only just because of timeliness, but it, uh, as you've seen with COVID, there's been significant reduction in contagion, um, both on the side of the healthcare provider as well as the patient. And then finally, the real key to this is I think that telemedicine is just one component of this whole paradigm shift in healthcare delivery that will involve significant remote monitoring, longitudinal patient monitoring, virtual care using artificial intelligence. And all these combined, all these technologies combined are going to really revolutionize care in this next in the next few years. Uh, next slide, please. To start with, there was a survey done by American Well, which is one of the largest telemedicine providers in the United States. And what they showed in this 2019 survey that of physicians who were using telemedicine, there was enormous buy-in, 93%. 93% of all physicians that were using telemedicine felt that it improved the patient's access to care. 77% felt that it improved their use of time and they were more efficient in their care of patients because of the advent of telemedicine and the utilization. 71% felt that it reduced healthcare costs and another 71% believed that it improved communication with patients. 60% believe that it improved the physician-patient relationship. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the COVID event has really just been a catalyst for telemedicine. And what it's done is it's created the financial incentive alignment necessary for us to move down the technology adoption curve what I'm showing here is a sort of a typical S-shaped technology adoption curve. And we were very early, we're still very early in the development of telemedicine capabilities. But because of the financial incentive alignment, there's been, and also because of the COVID uh, pandemic and the need for there to be separation between clinicians and patients, and the fear that a lot of patients had of going to acute care facilities, the, the, the use of telemedicine has really blossomed. There are early reports that the usage has increased by tenfold by some of the large players. So what it's done is it's moved us to that inflection point where the technology now has the opportunity to rapidly advance. The deployment will increase significantly. What that does is it creates an amount, a, a significant amount of more dollars that will be used for the development of new technologies, which in, tan, which in turn just improve the, the capabilities of, table, of uh, telemedicine, how it can be used, which then results in greater incentive alignment and even more adoption. And so what we're gonna see now is we're gonna move to that exponential growth in telemedicine. Uh, as long as we can keep up the momentum and the um, various payers recognize the significant advantage that the clinicians have recognized and the patients have recognized, we should start to see now telemedicine really bloom. Next slide, please. Now, May is actually going to talk significantly more about this, but as a result of COVID, what we've seen is that not only CMS has started to reimburse for a variety of telemedicine services, Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare, Humana, all of the large plans are creating mechanisms to reimburse clinicians for telemedicine visits. And that is really now driving clinicians to use the technology more. It's also, as we mentioned earlier, patients are already starting to ramp up their use of the technology. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, it's too early it's too early for us to really assess the impact of telemedicine. So what we're trying to do is start to look at some of the benefits and it's, it's akin to looking at 
the four megapixel camera. When the four megapixel camera uh, was the state of the art for digital cameras, all these photographers said, it'll, it'll never take hold. It's got limited use. There's all these other instances where we need to um, still use plain film for photography. As that technology has advanced, what we've seen is essentially the entire world has moved away from plain film and moved to digital uh, photography. And then digital uh, imaging now has completely supplanted analog imaging. And what we're, so what we're seeing is a similar effect in telemedicine. For example, right now, most of the large players, Teladoc, et cetera, they still require board certified physicians to answer calls. Why? Because the technology is very early. As, as, as we move down that technology curve, what we're gonna see is that a larger variety of clinicians will be able to provide telemedicine services. And we see that actually in all areas of medicine. It used, there was a time where people did not use physician's assistants and nurse practitioners, and their growth has increased dramatically over the last 30 years. And you see them in all types of different clinical scenarios and the types of clinical scenarios where they're able to provide care is expanding every day. Similarly, what we're gonna find is as we move to a larger variety of clinicians able to use telemedicine, the cost per encounter is gonna drop significantly. Second of all, we haven't started to leverage AI supported clinical pathways and care algorithms, which are particularly amenable to this type of technology. That will actually significantly improve care. It'll increase uniformity of care. It'll allow for a greater variety of clinicians to provide services. It will even automate care, which will significantly reduce the cost and make it much more scalable and accessible in very remote locations. And finally, patients have not even started to understand the technology and use the technology as the patients actually recognize this as another form of healthcare delivery, and they start to avail themselves of the technology, what we're gonna find is that patients are gonna become much more adept at understanding when the technology should be used, when other types of uh, healthcare delivery uh, needs to be accessed. So next slide, please. Here's just one example of a health system that has changed the way they practice, partially because of COVID, and but only because the of the fact that telemedicine was available to them. And they have uh, this is Banner Health System. This article just came out a couple of days ago, uh, May 14th, where they have moved to uh, virtual waiting rooms. And I'm just going to read this. Working with technology company LifeLink, Banner Health is using mobile chatbots to help patients remotely complete the paperwork and check-in processes for medical appointments before they step into the clinic. As part of the health system's initiative to reimagine the care delivery experience, Banner Health has used LifeLink chatbots to help hundreds of thousands of patients navigate emergency rooms. Virtual rating room is being used for telehealth visits and in-person appointments. That's just one example. What we're gonna see is many, many different examples are gonna to start to pop up. For example, the pre-op check that has to be done often by the anesthesiologist. There's no reason that that can't be done completely remotely and that the, it saves the patient a visit to the care facility. It improves the um, speed at which information is available to the clinician and it can be completely automated to some significant degree. Post-op visits can be done in a similar fashion. So you're looking at all types of new opportunities to utilize telemedicine that are still just starting to ramp up and that we actually haven't even recognized the, the most of the potential of telemedicine. So with the advent of COVID, we've seen a lot of uh, primary care physicians move to the use of telemedicine. We've seen healthcare systems use it for um, acutely triaging patients so that they can maintain that uh, social distancing, but we haven't begun to see the wide variety of other applications that are going to start being used, that telemedicine is going to start being used for. Next slide, please. So here are just some of the opportunities. 
One I mentioned um, was the tele-RME, uh, which is sort of the triage, the tele-triage of patients. And that can not only be done within a hospital, you can start to use resources across multiple hospitals and actually create uh, significant scalability and, and efficiency and resource utilization. We discussed telepsychiatry briefly. That's a key area where there's been significant opportunity for, um, for the use of telemedicine, telehealth capabilities. First of all, I mentioned this in the, my previous HIMSS talk, uh, psychiatry and emergency psychiatry is one of the most underbedded areas in the, in the practice of medicine in the United States. It can take two to three days between when a person is seen in the emergency department and when they're placed in an emergent and in, in a psychiatric emergency facility, just because of the lack of beds. Well, because telemedicine, if you use a telemedicine um, source as the point of telepsychiatry, what you can do is you can significantly decrease the time that it takes a, an emergency patient to see a psychiatrist. Instead of waiting two or three days, the patient can be seen in the emergency department by the emergency physician, and then immediately within, within minutes be seen by a psychiatrist. And that second visit can be done purely uh, through a telemedicine component. Now the psychiatrist doesn't need to be on site. You reduce the need for the psychiatric hospital because in a significant majority of cases, actually, the patients don't need to be transferred or admitted by a psychiatrist. You've opened up the emergency department bed because now the patient's discharged earlier. So you're improving the care of all the other patients, not just that single emergency psychiatry patient, you're improving the care of every patient that's waiting. As I mentioned, other specialty services where you don't need a single clinician at one facility, such as teleneurology and various other specialties where it doesn't, uh, where care doesn't uh, demand a full-time clinician, you can create scalability there. And then there are certain specialties that are very amenable to the use of telemedicine, primary care, dermatology, behavioral medicine. I just wanna spend a moment on this first bullet point, the statewide uh, AI supported triage algorithm for the next COVID surge. And I mentioned this because one of the things that we could look at that maybe someone in this audience can look at helping develop actually is a mechanism for triaging patients on a statewide basis when the next COVID surge occurs. So when we think about this current COVID pandemic, there was at one point a single human that was the vector for the COVID pandemic. It started with a single individual being infected. We literally have tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who have subclinical COVID infections who may be carriers now. Literally tens and maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe even more, it's, it's completely unknown. Well, when shelter in place ends and, and, and who knows if it's going to come back, during the next COVID surge, you're starting at a much different starting point now if you have all these carriers that are already infected and the surge could be much, much, much larger. And so we were concerned about overwhelming the healthcare system with this current COVID pandemic. It's, it's very possible that the next COVID surge that maybe, maybe it occurs this fall, maybe this winter, could completely overwhelm the health systems. If we could create a telemedicine AI supported triage tool where patients could call in and through a really almost through a chat bot, it could be determined whether they need to seek emergent care or, or uh, urgent care or something that is even less acute that could be seen by their primary care physician or no care at all. And that could be done purely through a telemedicine capability. And we could start looking at how providers can, can work together to create that type of system so that we don't overwhelm the health system during this next COVID surge that um, could occur, hopefully it won't, but that's a very real likelihood that people are starting to recognize is that it could occur again. And if it does, it could be much worse. And here's an example of a telemedicine opportunity 
That's, that's just truly enormous. Next slide, please. And here's some other considerations I just want to end with. First of all, um, we, we've discussed at least briefly some of the opportunities that exist in, co in telemedicine. We've discussed some of the ways that telemedicine is being used and some of the ways, uh, some of the new technologies that will impact telemedicine in the future. Some of the things to consider in terms of next steps as well as opportunities is data analytics. Telemedicine lends itself incredibly well to data analytics. The event can be totally, um, you can create totally structured data fields and then you can analyze large data sets in terms of what patients are coming on in with when influenza-like illnesses are occurring and, and where they're occurring. So if you can coordinate these systems, you can start to look at, well, where, where's the next COVID surge gonna be? What regions of the, of the country are being impacted? Similarly, uh, other areas to look at for improvement, electronic health record integration. A lot of the telemedicine uh, services right now are not integrated with electronic health record that uh, impacts the information consolidation when we can start to create um, information consolidation, electronic health record integration, it makes care seamless between providers. That is a significant opportunity um, for telemedicine. AI supported care, another area that is just barely starting out that people are starting to look at is creating chatbots that actually work with telemedicine um, vendors and platforms to improve the care delivery and the uniformity, and then longitudinal patient monitoring. This is an area that's particularly amenable to remote uh, monitoring telemedicine, and that will significantly improve healthcare. For, for many years, one of the few areas of longitudinal patient monitoring has been Holter monitors and cardiac arrhythmias. And what we've seen through that type of technology is it allows for a type of diagnosis that isn't available in tertiary care facilities because in a tertiary care facility, they have a very, very narrow window in which they have the opportunity to evaluate the patient. There are various conditions where you need to evaluate the patient over a much longer period of time, for example, as we mentioned, arrhythmias, but now they're coming out with technologies for gait socks that can predict when patients will fall with voice recognition, uh, uh, voice interpretation software that can detect changes in patient mood, if they're depressed, if they're having anxiety problems. They are even coming out with monitors that can monitor heart sounds over a significant period of time. And they're starting to be able to predict when people go into congestive heart failure in advance. These type of longitudinal patient monitoring devices are particularly amenable to telemedicine and telehealth. And so now when you take AI supported algorithms, longitudinal patient monitoring, telemedicine, what we're doing is we're creating a paradigm shift in care that in increases the scalability, improves the care, improves the efficiency, creates new clinician opportunities um, in terms of using a wider variety of clinicians to provide services. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's really hard to go over every, the, the entire current state of telemedicine. A lot of information is so new and is being developed. Sit, as we're speaking, the, the number of individuals that are using telemedicine has surged since the COVID pandemic. And so even that type of information is just starting to come in. It'll take significant time for us to even analyze the state of telemedicine right now because it's changing so rapidly. And the new opportunities where telemedicine can be used are just starting to be explored. So we're seeing significant change. There's gonna be enormous opportunity uh, I'd like to turn this over to May, who's going to be talking about some of the legislative changes that are ongoing right now and that are significantly impacting telemedicine. Thank you, Prentice, and thank you everyone for having me here today. 
Um, my name is Meg Huang. I'm the executive director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. Uh, we're pulling up the PowerPoint right now, and I am showing a little bit of a lag with the slides with Prentice went over. So if, if I get off track on my slides in my talk, just let me know and um, I'll reorient myself. But hopefully we won't have that issue here. Um, next slide, please. So I'm an attorney and as an attorney, I always have to start off with a disclaimer. So anything that I talk about today should not be considered legal advice. CCHP always recommends that you consult with legal counsel if you're interested in a formal legal opinion. And if I happen to mention a company or show some type of product, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of financial arrangement or relationship with such a, such a company. Next slide, please. So the Center for Connected Health Policy was established in 2009 and we're a program underneath the, tele, uh, the Public Health Institute. And we were actually started as a California telehealth policy organization and we still do some of that work today, even though we are the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Research Center. We became that through a grant from HRSA in 2012 uh, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of other partners on various more specific focus projects related to connected health and telehealth. And that's just a listing of some of our partners that we work with. Next slide, please. So some of the projects that we do um, with our work at here at CCHP, we do do a 50 state telehealth policy report where we track all of the Medicaid policies, laws and regulations related to telehealth for all 50 states in the District of Columbia. We also uh, track um, federal legislation as well. We also act as the administrator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And we are the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. So the California Telehealth Policy Coalition was actually started in 2011 wow. when CCHP uh, was acting as the technical advisor for and um, policy expert for a bill that was going through uh, the California legislature. It was AB 415, which was the Telehealth uh, Advancement Act. So that was the act that updated the California telehealth laws, which had not really been updated since 1996. Uh, the coalition formed with just really a handful of different parties who were interested in in that particular bill. And it's now grown to over 70 statewide organizations. Actually, now that I think about it, we're probably closer to 80 statewide organizations. And these groups um, are just interested in California telehealth policy and try to work collaboratively together. So there's not sort of cross purposes or we're duplicating any type of work. Um, anybody is welcome to join that group. Just send me an email that you're interested in joining. We meet monthly. Uh, there's there's no obligation of like you have to attend a certain amount of meetings. It's just when you can do it, you can just join in on the group and attend our monthly meetings. We also do have um, subcommittees that uh, focus in on education around telehealth as well as uh, another subcommittee that focuses in on legislative efforts. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. And what that is, is that there are 14 telehealth resource centers, two national centers, and 12 regional resource centers. CCHP is the National Center on Policy, but there's also one on technology. And then the 12 regional resource centers, they, they actually serve specific states. Um, and they focus more on the program operational level questions, so people who are interested in starting a telehealth program or have questions about maybe how to refine their existing program, they usually reach out to the telehealth resource centers first, the regional ones. But we all work fairly collaboratively together. So I like to say when you reach out to one TRC, you actually get all 14 of us. And California has its own telehealth resource centers, the California Telehealth Resource Center. And you can find their contact information by going to that URL. Next slide, please. Just really quickly, this is just a snapshot of our CCHP website and the 50 state report that I talked about where we track all of the Medicaid policies, laws and regulations. We update that twice a year, a spring update and a fall update. And to, to give you an idea of how telehealth policy has evolved on the state level over the years, we first did the first edition in 2012 
2013. We released it January 2013, and that was a 250-page report. We just finished up our spring update and released it a few weeks ago, and that is up to like close to 500 pages at this point. So like within that period from 2013 to now 2020, over seven years, you've seen at least content-wise a double in size essentially. Um, Actually, we were in the middle of our spring update when COVID hit. So the information we have updated is the established statutory policies, the established Medicaid policies, does not contain the emergency waivers that we've seen, you know, filtering out that has been like all over the news and been impacting how we've been using telehealth now because those are temporary waivers for the most part. What we have in our um, 50 state report are like the permanent what's on the books it's not going to change unless they decide to do a law change or like a formal uh, policy change so the, that information is where that is on our website and then we have a special section for the COVID information because that is temporary we did not want to include that into the permanent record because it is fairly labor intensive for us to um, do these 50 state updates next slide please so I've been asked to talk about some of the policy changes that have happened in the face of COVID. And as you're all aware, there has been a lot of policy changes, both on the federal and on the state level. And this slide really looks at just sort of high level overview where a lot of these policy changes have occurred. And for the most part, they've been around the reimbursement. Um, because most of the established policy pre-COVID-19 that's on the books within Medicaid, within Medicare, were related to reimbursement. When, where, who, how did you get paid? So that's why we've seen like a lot of the waivers involving like those types of issues of like getting paid. Now, not all of the waivers have been related to that. We've heard waivers around, you know, HIPAA. We've heard waivers or, or rather changes and temporary changes in like how you prescribe. But for the most part, the majority of policies have been related to, you know, providing services and getting reimbursed for them. And where we've seen like a lot of the, the changes occurring in specific issues is around where the patient's located, the modality that you can use to deliver service, what type of services are covered, and also the type of provider who's allowed to provide those services. Um, on the Medicare side, there were a lot of changes that had to be made because Medicare actually had one of the most restrictive telehealth reimbursement policies out there. And one of the reasons for that is because a lot of their policies is dictated by federal statute and that federal statute really had not been updated in like years. So it was out of date. It was very narrow. So you, we saw like a lot of waivers coming from CMS saying like this is what you can do now underneath um, Medicare if you're using telehealth. And a lot of it did relate to, you know, the location of the patient, the type of providers providing services, what services are covered. And then most interesting modality, you know, Prentice talked about it and talking about the future and what some of the modalities had to use. The more, really the modality that they talked about with the CMS policy and the waiver was really live video or they were talking about audio only phone. So they didn't really touch upon like expanding the use of store and forward or remote patient monitoring. It was really live video and phone. And we see these types of changes also reflected on the state level. So in general, what a lot of states did when they did their waivers and for telehealth policy involved those same type of changes, like expanding where the patient could be when the telehealth interaction is taking place. And it was you know, explicitly saying it can be in the home now. Because before COVID-19, and this includes Medicare, not only just Medicaid, but uh, the programs, the Medicaid programs that allowed the home to be an eligible originating site were only allowing it for certain things. And that was the same for Medicare. So in Medicare, prior to COVID-19, they only allowed the home to be an eligible site if they were receiving, the patient was receiving end-stage renal diseases or if they've been diagnosed and receiving OUD, opioid use disordered services or services for a co-occurring, diagnosed co-occurring mental health issue. And that was it. And you saw that reflected in the states as well. They had very specific policies and what they would allow to be done in the home via telehealth. And it was usually around some sort of chronic care management um, oversight or services. So what we saw with COVID is expanding the types of services that can take place in the home, 
very logical. People were sheltering in place. People were isolating themselves. So you still needed to get the services to people. They needed to be in their homes. But it was, not everybody was like at home just needing to receive end-stage renal disease services or for like chronic care um, type of services. You needed to expand the type of services that could take place there. So we saw a lot of states also a lot opening up the home to be an eligible originating site. Modality. So modality, again, the states really did not focus in on saying we're going to do more for storm forward, we're going to do more for remote patient monitoring, but they did note that they were allowing the phone to, to be a way of providing services. And this goes back to, you know, not everybody may have the broadband capability or the equipment in order to, you know, use telehealth, the live video option as well. Phone may be the only way. So they were addressing that particular need. And then expanding the list of providers. This was a major change on the federal level with Medicare, where they basically opened it up to um, any provider who was a Medicare eligible provider, and they were providing a service that was on the list of specific services that Medicare was allowing to be provided via telehealth. And they said, if, if you guys fit into those categories, you're fine, we'll reimburse you, which is a huge change in Medicare because Medicare did have like a very narrow list of eligible providers. We're seeing states doing that as well. Um, so they're either adding like federally qualified health centers or rural health centers and allowing them to act as distance site providers, but more, more likely what they're doing is also expanding it to allied health professionals to be eligible providers too. Um, so those are some of the things that have been going on just, you know, broad sort of broad view on the federal and the state levels, just states in general. Next slide, please. One other thing that I did want to pause and point out um, that were federal developments uh, that's not exactly related to reimbursement was what was going on with the DEA. So for those who don't know or are not familiar with this, federal law covers prescribing of controlled substances and there's like a narrow band of like how you can do that with telehealth without having that in-person exam um, and one of those sort of narrow exceptions when a public health emergency is declared so that kicked in and they opened that up but also recognizing again where people may have that technology that digital divide where they can't have like telehealth um, access to telehealth the live video component of it the uh, DEA did say, you know, when you're treating somebody who's been diagnosed for an opioid use disorder, they're allowing you to prescribe buprenorphine, which is one of the medications used to, to treat somebody with that disorder, if certain conditions are met, and you can do it over the phone. So this, again, this is recognition of that potential digital divide that some populations may have in that they may not access sort of more our traditional views of telehealth like live video. And then one other thing I did want to point out with the feds is the FCC, they did have or do have a COVID-19 telehealth program where they were um, allotted $200 million to help healthcare providers provide connected care services to patients in their homes and mo mobile locations. So I think they still are accepting applications of that. They've been, um, they have not awarded all of that money. So for those who are here and may wish to apply for it, that's the link that'll give you more information on that program. Next slide, please. So overall in the states, what we're seeing in relation to COVID, um, pre-COVID and on the Medicaid program is that basically all states reimburse for some type of live video, storm forward, and remote patient monitoring are a little bit less popular. Next slide. What also influences state telehealth policy is um, a lot of states have, the majority of states have on their books a private payer law telling commercial payers this is how you treat telehealth. And this can vary very widely in what they require. Uh, they can require everything from, or they can say, the law can say everything from health plans, you can cover telehealth if you wish to do so, to a state that may say health plans, you will cover telehealth delivered services the same as you would have had it been done in person and by the way you will say, pay the same amount and then everybody falls in in between those two extremes and that also dictated you know how much and how far some of the executive orders during COVID went and like what they were telling um, commercial payers what they needed to do during this time as well. Next slide please. And 
this is just again some of the most common things of like the executive orders what they were ordering or requiring to do around telehealth i did want to point out so i did mention that um on the state level they were allowing phone to be a modality i think there's a little there's been some confusion among providers on that as well so there's there's sort of two buckets and cms is the one that set this up and how you approach technology delivered services Underneath Medicare policy, you have your bucket for telehealth, which is the stuff that's in federal law and how you do it and so forth. And it, it is explicitly labeled telehealth, and it's the one with all the restrictions that have been waived. And then Medicare has this other sort of bucket of services that they say is not sort of a exact replacement like telehealth is for an in-person service. It's these other services that you can provide via telehealth technologies that we're calling something else. We're calling them communication-based services or technology-enabled services. And some of these services have, you've always been able to use audio phone. Um, and one of them is like a quick check-in, the virtual check-in services, which is G2012 and G2010. Phone has always been an option for that. It doesn't have like the telehealth restrictions. It's been around for a couple of years. So one thing that we have encountered with providers during COVID when they have said, when a, a commercial payer has said, we're allowing phone, um, telehealth via phone. The commercial payers have been talking about these virtual check-in codes. So some providers have gotten a bit of a surprise when they've like built these codes and then they said, why do we only get $10 for this telehealth visit? Well, it wasn't exactly a telehealth visit. It's this virtual check-in visit that you did and that's how you coded it. So there's been a little bit of confusion in like, you know, well, what does it mean by phone? And some have meant like these communication enabled technologies, which tend to pay less. Um, but do allow you to use phone as opposed to like services that are, are that they have on a list of services eligible to be provided via telehealth and they've like allowed you to use the extra modality of using phone to deliver certain ones of those services which you would get paid what you typically would for delivering that service so wanted to make that distinction because I think that got a little bit muddled in in some of the policies that have been out there and has confused some providers as well next slide please And this slide is just talking about sort of other changes that we've we've seen, but they've been less popular, such as um, again going beyond like phone and additional modalities that to be used during COVID, um, expanding the list of providers. Again, that hasn't been consistent on the state level. Some states have been doing it, um, some others have not. But they've also been doing like some have only said allied health professionals. Some have said like you know we're opening up to everybody who's eligible. So that's been a little bit um, inconsistent as well. And most states have some type of consent requirement too. So there's been, again, sort of like uneven type of relaxation of that. Um, for the most part, what we've seen is if they've required a written consent, they're allowing it to be verbal. Next slide, please. So what is going on in California? Actually, pre-COVID-19, going into COVID, California Medicaid program was probably in a better spot than a lot of Medicaid programs because just coincidentally, California had updated their Medicaid policies last summer and they really expanded them. They did expand it to the, the idea of you can use live video or store and forward. It's up to the provider to decide. And as long as it's a service that Medicaid covers and as long as there's no in-person requirement, California Medicaid will pay for it. So it was like pretty expansive to begin with, but even California had to make some changes as well. So they had to allow the use of phone as modality. Um, FQHCs and RHCs, they were limited in how they could use telehealth and get reimbursed for it. That was expanded for them. There were some also some relaxing of the consent and privacy requirements. Um, overall, what we found is that the administration has been fairly responsive in dealing with like the barriers and trying to remove them. Um, this is, we have to keep in mind, not only for, for the California, but also for Medicare as well, that we are talking about large agencies trying to pivot very quickly to address the need. And, you know, they have been moving quickly I and mean, faster than I've ever seen them move on telehealth policy. Um, and the California administration, for the most part, for a lot of the issues that the telehealth field has raised, they've addressed them, you know, fairly rapidly, the, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. However, what we've noticed is it has been difficult for systems to adjust, um, you know, such as we've, we've heard from providers saying, like, we submitted this claim, and they told it, we did exactly how they told us, but it got rejected. And part of it has been, like, 
the processing system has not been able to make those changes and those adjustments as quickly. So it's it's been like, you know, trying to, to as I had a former supervisor say, you know, trying to turn a battleship on a dime, it, it's probably going to take a little bit more time in order to, you know, have like those processes in place as like, you know, the policies are passed and trying to match them up. Next slide, please. So the question remains that's on a lot of people's mind is like, what's going to happen in a post-COVID-19 world? So what I'm going to go over, again, it's just my opinion. I don't have any insights. Like policymakers have not like given me a heads up and said this is what we're doing. But this is sort of my best guess as to what's going to go on. Next slide, please. I think some policy changes will remain, and I think some of the major ones that have the highest likelihood of staying around is essentially allowing the home to be an eligible originating site. You know, this is not going to be over in two or three months. You're still at least going to have some people needing to, like, minimize their outside interactions to probably stay at home, vulnerable populations as well. Um, an expanded list of providers, I think, will also um, – stick around as well and the expanded types of service that will be covered will stick around as well. However, there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to need to be resolved as well. Um, connectivity and broadband, again going back to why phone was used, is not everybody had that connection. Um, the digital divide, not everybody has the access to the equipment that they may need if they're doing a service at home or be able to like work that type of service type of equipment. I'll give you a good example. My mother is in that most vulnerable category. She's a senior. She has chronic conditions. Um, she needs to really minimize her exposure. Her doctors were doing a lot of telehealth interactions for her. She would not have been able to work that equipment or have the equipment available to her if I was not with her doing that and facilitating all that for her. So how do you like not leave those populations, those people behind? Licensure, I think it's always been a hot topic like broadband was pre-COVID-19 where telehealth was concerned. I think it's going to probably, the talk is going to increase and you may have more policymakers interested in looking at doing something or at least having a more thorough discussion about it. Uh, why? Um, why would that be something that they may be interested in? I think probably because you're going to see po some policymakers actually impacted by this. Uh, an example of it is College students, so campuses closed down, students were sent home. Students were probably sent home where they live in another state from where the college campus were. That student may have been receiving student health services from their college uh, student health center. They may still want to receive them. Unlikely that provider of that student health center was licensed in the student's home state can't receive the services then. And I that's actually an issue that I've had um, policymakers, a policymaker personally encounter. So it wasn't them personally, but somebody that they knew. So when you have like that personal, uh, that personal experience with it, I think you might get them more likely to want to talk about it. And then like that college, uh, school-based uh, type of college or student-based health program example, it's going to be, there's going to be questions on, you know, where else can this be deployed? Where else can you use telehealth and what to use it for? With groups who maybe had not considered using telehealth beforehand. Next slide, please. And I will go over this very quickly. We have, we're living in an uncertain world. Things I don't quite know are how it's going to impact things and where things are going to happen. We have major budget constraints. There's a shortfall now with the California budget. I don't know how that's going to impact bills. And Nancy, I think it's going to go into that a little bit more, but I'm it's thinking like it's possibly going to like limit the type of policy bills that would get passed because if there's a price tag of attached to it, if it's not directly related to COVID, policymakers may not exactly be interested in like passing those bills. I know there were a series of telehealth bills that were taken up in the assembly on Monday and they did get out of health committee, but usually appropriations is a place where bills can go to die because if they have, again, if they have a price tag attached to them, they're going to get a lot of scrutiny as well. And then the other sort of uncertainty is on the federal level is that we are in an election year. So things happen, strange things can sometimes happen in election year in regards to policy that may also have an impact in what we see happening next. Next slide, please. And I will do these very quickly. These are just a couple of resources for you. Um, California actually put up a new website that has information for 
um, consumers where they can actually uh, look up what, via zip code what health plans may be covering telehealth services um, and also just some general information. Next slide. And then a slide that the Health and Human Services Department put up as well with information for patients and providers that they can also, you know, look at and have various resources too. And the next slide is um, some resources that CCHP has to like our COVID information, a newsletter, and then that's it, just our um, information, contact information if you have any like further questions. Thank you. Turn it back over to Nancy. Thank you, May, for that. I wanted to just talk to the audience for a minute. I noticed we have about 60 people online. We started a virtual march on May 5th uh, um, with our first webinar uh, with National. There is a virtual march platform right now in California. We are asking our HIMSS members to sign the virtual march to support uh, these three bills, AB 2164. This is a bill to create an e-consult and telehealth assistance grant program um, with the Department of Healthcare Services for a health-centered controlled networks, health centers and rural health centers. So this is where we talk about these things can die on the floor when it comes to money. This will allow um, the capability to have a, a grant program to help with telehealth assistance. AB 2464 is a bill that is um, put out on the floor, it will establish a grant program to fund a statewide pediatric behavioral telehealth network. This is a great um, program, you guys, when we talk about behavioral health and children in our state. Um, and then Senate Bill 1278, which will ensure that generally accepted standards of practice that apply to healthcare providers under their license also will apply while providing um, telehealth services. So this bill really does go back to standards of uh, um, standard operating procedures and just ensuring that um, accepted standards of care and standards of practice are in place, um, right? And there's regulations around that for telehealth, just like there, there are for face-to-face -face encounters. So in order for you guys to support these bills, and to get a letter to your legislator, I'm just going to walk you through the process here. You'll click the link. We'll send it out to you again. If you don't have it, it's a call to action link. It'll come from um, Northern and Southern California HIMSS chapter. So you'll get it in your email. Click that link and it'll take you to this page. Jenny, if you'll just scroll down, there's information about the bills. You can click on these links and actually read the bills there. Um, uh, between all three bills, there's uh, about um, under 20 pages. So one of the bills is a little bit long. It's 12 pages. But the other two are real short. You can really read them if you'd like to. We do need your name. Jenny, if you could scroll down just a little bit more. You'll be filling out your name, your address, your home address, or your work address if you work in the state of California. Your zip code will send this letter to your legislator based on where you live. Uh, that's all you do right here. The letter is pre-written. Uh, it's, a, it's a template letter. So once you fill this out, you'll submit your name. The letter will pop up. You'll be able to hit submit and it will be fired off to your legislators to support these three bills um, for telehealth in the state of California that are currently, um, they have moved through um, the healthcare committee. They will go for, um, for votes. So, um, if we can get enough support for that, uh, we want to move these bills forward. That's all it takes. It takes about a minute. If you want to edit the letter, the template that goes to all of the legislators, you do have the capability to do that as well. You can put your own stamp on that letter if you want to take the time to do that. Uh, it takes about a minute uh, to get this done. Right now, I, I do have to say, uh, we've had some disappointing numbers, you guys. We've got 46 people who have signed um, this legislative call to action. So uh, we've got 60 folks online today. If you haven't done this legislative action, um, please go ahead and, and do that and support these bills, and let's see if we can get them passed through. That's all I have. I'm, I think we're going to bring up Prentice. We've got some questions. Um, if we and look at our question screen. Prentice, the first question, is Prentice up yet? I think um, 
My one to you, May one to you, is the 50 state telehealth policy report available online? Is that is that report that you do each year available online? Yes, it's available on the CCHP website at cchpca.org. Um, you'll see when you go there, there's just a big tab up to the, the left-hand corner. You'll see and you can click on it. It's available as a PDF and also in that interactive map. So if you're just interested in one particular state, you can just click on it. You can also do a search for like, you know, live video reimbursement in Medicaid like that. Okay. Um, and then Rebecca Woodcock is asking if reimbursement for RPM is being expanded or what barriers do you see there? So remote patient monitoring, if you're talking about Medicare, it's one of those areas where they've stuck it in that other bucket of like communications-based technology or communication-enabled technologies. That's where they have the remote patient monitoring um, reimbursement. If you're talking about California, we have asked them about that over the past year, especially when they expanded the services. If they were looking at remote patient monitoring, they said, well, we can, we'll consider it. Um, but they do reimburse, I believe, for a couple of those codes that CMS does in that other bucket of technology-enabled services. And there's also a report on CCHP's website that lists all the states and what they reimbursed in like, those other types of technology-enabled services. Um, we did that at the beginning of the year, so it should be good through like 2020, uh, unless they've like updated their policies again in mid-year. So that's also available on the CCHP website. Okay. Nancy, um, I see there was another question from Rebecca on AI examples in uh, telehealth. Um, actually, I, yeah. I know Steve Grau um, supplied just one, or Vita is working on a uh, chat bot for COVID specifically, but that's actually an area that Vituity is actively working on. We partnered with a company called Decoded Health. It's an SRI supported um, company. And we're creating uh, AI-supported algorithms uh, and automation of the entire triage process so that, and we're working with payers right now, so that um, patients can actually use the service, determine if they need to go to an emergency department at all. And not only does that improve care for the patients, it improves care for all the other patients that are going to the emergency department, which is sometimes hard to measure. But if you have a automated mechanism of diverting patients that don't need emergency department care to another uh, source of care, not only is their care more appropriate, more efficient, and less expensive, but that care again for all the other patients that are now needing the higher level of service is 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 more available. Um, someone's asking when do we expect the emergency declaration to be withdrawn? <laughs> yeah. Your guess is as good at all as mine, yeah. Um, I, I would think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I got a little bit nervous when Secretary Azar was saying, like, well, over half the counties were reporting, were, like, starting to drop. It's like, ooh, is he getting ready to declare the public health emergency over on the national level? Um, I don't know exactly when, but I think as more places open and if they, if they say, like, they start seeing the numbers going down, it could be soon. Um, but I don't have an exact date. I haven't heard exact anybody date. say an exact date. Okay. Well, I want to I want to take a minute just to thank um, Dr. Tom and May for joining us today. I appreciate the presentation, and you guys out there um, who joined the webinar, uh, please check your email for the link to the virtual march and help us expand telehealth here in California. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we're right at one o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and sign off. Thank you for having us, bye. Thank you very much. By the way, I provided my uh, email address. And if anyone has other questions, please don't hesitate to email me. I'd be more than happy to respond. Thank you, Princess.